Well, hello, my name is Chris Griffiths. I think that we should get started. We've got quite a good crowd in already and there's others joining as I speak. So welcome to um, this edition of the ESDR Kitchen. We've been running this now for well over a year and it looks set to continue. It's uh, such a popular event. As you know, we have four um, themes in the kitchen. Uh, the recipe book where we talk about new research techniques, uh, freshly baked is where we discuss a couple of recently published high impact research papers and presented by the first authors of those papers. And then Molecular Cuisine, which is a, a, jo a journey of discovery from one of our eminent um, dermatology or skin biology researchers from across the world. Um, but today we're going to um, run our fourth theme, which is sweet and sour, which is where two uh, experts in a particular area will discuss or we'll have a scientific discourse about an important um, topic of interest. And this is one which is very close to my heart. Um, this is going to be um, psoriasis and autoimmune disease. Uh, it is supported by um, Pfizer and Bristol Myers Squibb today, and I'm absolutely delighted uh, that we have Johan Gudjonsson and Jörg Prince to discuss this. And uh, I'll hand over to uh, my co-chair, uh, Ellie Sprecher, uh, who will introduce the uh, session and introduce our two speakers. So over to you, Ellie. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chris, and uh, hello, everybody. So today's deba debate will revolve around a very uh, hot topic, as uh, Chris just mentioned, and we are very fortunate to have uh, with us today two leaders in the field, uh, Jörg Prince and Johan Gillianson. So Jörg Prince is full professor of dermatology and venerology at the Clinic for Dermatology and Allergology of the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, Germany. He studied medicine in Innsbruck, trained in immunology at the Institute for Immunology at the LMU in Munich, and then joined the Clinic for Dermatology and Allergology in 1990, where he founded the research group for immunopathology. He is deputy chair of the department and supervises the phototherapy unit and psoriasis center. His main research uh, interest is in the analysis of uh, the T-cell mediated immunopathogenesis of psoriasis and the identification of specific targets uh, for this response. Professor Prince has published extensively in major peer review journals on these and uh, other uh, major topics. Johan Gideonson is the uh, Arthur uh, C. Curtis Professor of Skin Molecular Immunology and Associate Professor of Dermatology and Taubman Medical Research Institute Scholar at the University of Michigan. Dr. Gideonson's primary research focus is basic immunological and genetic research on chronic inflammatory diseases. He has published over 180 peer-reviewed papers uh, in the highest ranked uh, journals like Nature Immunology, Nature Genetics, Immunity, JCI, and others. He received the Young Investigator Award from the American Academy of Dermatology in 2007, and his work has earned several research awards, including awards from the American Skin Association, the Doris Duke Foundation, and he was selected as the SID Rising Star Lecture in 2018. He was also elected as a member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation in 2020. So just before starting, I'd like to remind you all that this episode is supported by Pfizer and BMS. We will have at the end of uh, the talks uh, a quick uh, Q&A uh, session. So please forward your queries through the chat or the Q&A function uh, during the talk, uh, Johan and uh, Jorg. And it's a great honor for us to host you in our uh, kitchen and the floor is now yours. Well, thank you, Eli, uh, for the very nice introduction. I, I am delighted to be with you today and uh, excited to kind of show some of the uh, data that we've been working on and uh, very exciting kind of a topic and interaction. So looking very much forward to it. So my title is, the title of this is, is like Dr. Griffith said, uh, is psoriasis and autoimmune disease. Uh, these are my potential conflicts of interest. So just to kind of a, as a brief introduction, just talk about psoriasis. You can see some of my uh, uh, images that I've taken in the clinic from patients that I've seen over the years. So as you're all very familiar with, psoriasis is a chronic inflammatory disease of the skin uh, with a prevalence ranging from 0.2 to 4.8%, depending on the population study. The age of onset is often between adolescence and young adulthood. And once established, psoriasis tends to persist throughout life. It's accompanied by, a, by a inflammatory arthritis in about a quarter of patients. And this arthritis typically arises about 10 to 12 years after the onset of the skin disease. It's a very dynamic disease. This slide uh, or the image on the right 
kind of shows you the transition from uninvolved distant to uninvolved near edge of psoriasis and then the plaque center and the, and the active edge of psoriasis, which typically has the most marked inflammatory and histologic changes. So it's a hyperproliferative skin disease and characterized by these red scaly skin lesions. You can see this very marked epi epidermal hypoplasia, which is typically the most marked uh, changes that you can see on histology and psoriasis. There is this uh, very thick parakeratotic scale with uh, neutrophil microabscesses, and then you have dilatation of the, of the dermal blood vessels with uh, perivascular infiltrate with lymphocytes and dendritic cells. And this epithelial uh, hyperproliferation is, is very similar to what is seen in wound healing. And that's why uh, this process is sometimes referred to as regenerative maturation to kind of reflect the similarities to wound healing. So the psoriasis, the pathogenesis actually is quite complex. So it's a very busy slide that I have here on the right, but it kind of shows you the transition from psoriasis from predisposing factors to disease initiation and then disease maintenance. And if you have the right genotype, you have the right genetic makeup and you get the right trick or the environmental trick that can be microbe smoking, trauma, stress, and drugs. And the trick is in the epidermis or in the tonsils as with uh, strep infections, you kind of a set, you, you get going a cascade of events that kind of a will trigger activation of the uh, immune system. So it can be stress cells and through expression of catholicidin that binds with DNA, you get activation of plasmacytoidic dendritic cells that then activate dermal dendritic cells that go to the lymph nodes and through interleukin-12 and interleukin-23, uh, you activate Th1 and Th17 cells. This activation can also happen in the tonsils. And these cells go into the skin, they release uh, various cytokines such as interferon gamma, IL-17, that in turn activates the uh, epidermis. You get keratinocyte activation and proliferation. You get an amplification circuits that produces more cytokines, more chemokines, that brings in additional immune cells that then create a chronic sustaining cycle of inflammation that brings in more neutrophils. And it's fascinating if you look at the genetic predisposing factors that we have identified over, years, over the years, and we have now identified over 86, is that these, these fall into very defined biological classes and processes, such as interferon antiviral signaling, epidermal differentiation, autoinflammatory responses, T17 differentiation, IL-17 responses, antigen presentation, oxidative responses, TNF, NF kappa B uh, signaling, uh, interleukin-23 signaling, and T cell development. And it's quite interesting that, you know, like a highlight here, that many of these components that are involved in psoriasis belong to the innate immune responses or the innate immune system. This is kind of similar graph over here on the right. This is a much more simplified outline of the pathogenesis involving the myelodendritic cells, activating dendritic cells that in turn activate Th1 and Th17 cells. You get activation of keratinocytes and then produce uh, cytokines and chemokines that then bring in more immune cells. So you get this adaptive immune response and innate immune response. What you have here on the left is, is the different genetic susceptibility factors outlined over single cell data from psoriasis. And I'm showing you keratinocyte data, melanocytes, acron glands, endothelial fibroblast, nerve cells, T cells, myeloid, and mast cells. And if you look at it this way, you can see that here in red, many of the risk genes in psoriasis are, are found in keratinocytes. You get quite a, quite a proportion of T cells, uh, myeloid cells, uh, but it's the other cells that are not well studied or appreciated in psoriasis pathogenesis that are also show up, like endothelial cells. Quite a few of the risk genes involve endothelial cells. Fibroblasts actually also are a component, and then nerve cells. So again, psoriasis is a much more complex, multicellular type process that we really give it credit for. Um, as I mentioned before, the most marked histologic change in psoriasis is, has to do with the keratinocytes. This is single cell data that shows you the different uh, compartments of, of, of cells, so basal cells, spinal cells, and supraspinal cells, that's the different layers of the epidermis. If you look at the, uh, the psoriasis keratinocytes versus the uh, normal or non-lesional psoriatic uh, keratinocytes, they're completely separate from the single cell data. Um, and if you look at the gene expression in the different compartments shown here, basal, spinous, and supraspinous, 
it's the psoriasis ones that are completely different in terms of the gene expression than the ones found in normal or non lesional skin. And that has to do with both basal spinous and supraspinous compartments. So very marked changes occurring across all epidermal compartments and psoriasis. If you look at the different immune responses and where they're actually happening in psoriasis, so interferon responses primarily found in the basal layer of the epidermis. This is psoriasis shown in blue compared to non-lesional and healthy skin here in red. And you can see that as you move up the uh, different epidermal layers, the interferon response goes down. So it's predominantly localized to the uh, basal layer. In contrast, IL-17 responses are most marked in psoriasis in the supraspinous compartments that are actually happening high up in the epidermis. And same with IL-36 responses. If you analyze the data in a little bit of a different way, you're looking at upstream regulators, it will show you pretty much the same uh, pattern with interferon signaling dominating in the basal compartment, also in the spinous, but when you shift over to the supraspinous compartment in, in, in psoriatic skin, it really is the IL-17 response that is dominating. And how does that fit with the expression of the IL-17 receptors? So if you look at non-lesional skin, a healthy non-lesional and, and psoriatic skin, this is a co-staining of the IL-17 receptor A and receptor C. You can see most of it is here in the upper spinous layers of the epidermis. There's really not much of IL-17 in the basal layer of the of psoriasis. And if you look at what's happening, this is uh, what we call a circus plot, showing you the different interactions uh, between uh, inflammatory mediators and psoriatic skin. Uh, it's the supraspinous compartment that has most of the neutrophil genes and also the IL-36 family of cytokines really kind of com being compartmentalized uh, and downstream of the IL-17 receptor signaling. And this is uh, the basis for what has been called the feed-forward amplification and psoriasis. We get activation of the dendritic cells and the T cells, we get release of cytokines such as IL-17 and TNF. It's activating uh, the uh, supraspinous compartment of the epidermis and that's where you really get most of the biological mediators that, that mediate and, and drive many of the hallmark features of psoriasis, such as keratinocyte proliferation, increased innate immunity, influx of neutrophils, influx of more T cells, particularly T17 cells, and then driving synergistic pro-inflammatory effects in the skin. So how important is IL-36 IL to this whole process? Uh, so this is data that we have been generating in the lab. We've been using CRISPR-Cas9 to kind of delete the IL-36 cytokines and IL-36 receptor. So if you look at the control, and then we have the three knockouts, IL-36, alpha knockout, gamma, and, and IL-36 IL receptor. So you can see that TNF and IL-17A are very good at, 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 at inducing expression of many of the hallmark genes in psoriasis, such as beta defensin, IL-36 receptor antagonist, IL-36 gamma, or S100A7. If you take out the IL-36 receptor or the IL-36 gamma, you, you almost completely shut down downstream responses of IL-17 and TNF. So what does this, this mean? So again, in terms of the, uh, the inflammatory and cytokine circuits that are occurring in psoriasis, you have a type one and type two interferon loop that is mostly self-sustaining. You have a TH17 response loop in, in psoriasis. And then you have one that is driven by IL-36 cytokines and involving uh, neutrophils. So these three cytokine circuits in, in psoriasis are highly interactive, uh, but one primarily is involved in innate and in, in auto-inflammatory responses, and that's the IL-36 axis. Then on the other end, you have the adaptive immune response, the IL-17, the TH17 and TH1 which is more of an autoimmune response, but you can see that these coexist in psoriasis and they're intricately linked. Um, and it's the balance between the two arms of the image system that really dictates the clinical phenotype. So where you have less IL-36, but more TH17, you're more prone to kind of have plaque psoriasis. But if you have a situation where IL-36 is the dominant one, you switch over to postular psoriasis type phenotype. So psoriasis truly is as a spectrum of uh, clinical phenotypes. On one end, you have plaque psoriasis, and on the other end, you have generalized postural psoriasis. So it's the balance between the two components of the image system, the adaptive and the innate, that really kind of dictates the, uh, the clinical manifestation and where the disease is kind of going. So 
in a way, uh, so, so psoriasis is truly characterized by both autoimmune and autoinflammatory responses. On one end, it's the chronic plaque psoriasis. On the other end, it's the pustular psoriasis. And you have a different mixture of uh, T cell cytokines and then innate cytokines that kind of dictate the phenotype. And as I, what I have hoped that I've showed you, shown you uh, this, this morning, you, you can't really have one without the other. They're intricately linked and it doesn't really matter where you break the cycle. You just have to break it to really let the disease process uh, collapse. So we just took on a quickly summarize of so psoriasis as a complex genetically determined chronic inflammatory and, and autoimmune disease. The disease process involves components of the adaptive, uh, particularly T cells and in, in the innate immune system. Uh, multiple other uh, cells uh, types are essential in the disease activity, and this includes stromal cells such as fibroblasts and nerve and endothelial cells. Uh, and, a, a, and a very important feature of psoriasis is this amplification circuit, this feed forward in the epidermis that is activated in downstream of TNF and IL-17A and is dependent upon IL-36 activity. So thank you for listening, and that kind of concludes my talk. Uh, I just wanted to quickly acknowledge my funding sources over the years and my uh, many collaborators that I've worked that I worked with over the years. So thank you. Sorry. Uh, what keeps it going and uh, somehow provide data that really give you an idea about the immune response which takes place in psoriasis lesions. Now, when we look at the clinical phenotype and all these differentially expressed genes in psoriasis lesions, we find it's a really complex process. However, just inserting or interfering with one particular point, which is T cell activity can completely revise this process, bring it back into normal skin, uh, thus showing that actually T cells seem to play a major role in manifestation of this inflammatory process. And for me, it was really the convincing observation when we treated psoriasis patients with T cell directed antibodies silencing T cell activity already in 1991. This is the first patient who ever received the biologic on purpose that within a very short period, you could downregulate inflammation and transduce the highly inflammatory phenotype into normal skin back again. In order, since this time, my work has have been focusing on what activates this immune response. And the genetic predisposition is a strong guidance what to look for. Johan already mentioned that there are more than 80 gene variants related to the risk of psoriasis. However, most of them are pleiotropic, meaning also associated with other diseases, and they confer only a low odds ratio. This Manhattan plot summarizes the data from genome-wise association studies. They show all these different gene variants, but they also highlight one particular locus, which probably is the actually disease-specific one. It is the HLAC region, which confirms the main psoriasis risk gene, HLAC0602. Now there's another gene that interacts with this HLA CO602 in influencing the psoriasis risk, which is the gene for era one, the endoplasmic reticulum aminopeptidase one. Gene-gene interaction means that two independently inherited genes combine to change the phenotype of a disease. And as you can see from this plot here, certain gene variants of era one can amplify the risk for psoriasis that is transmitted by psoriasis. And for me, this means that the association of psoriasis with HLA-CO6 and its epistasis with variants of ERA1 is actually the disease-specific genetic association, and it provides the clue to understand the autoimmune pathogenesis of psoriasis. And in order to understand this, we have to look at the role HLA class one molecules have in the, in the immune response. HLA class one molecules present peptide antigens to CD8 T cells. And these peptide antigens are derived from cytoplasmic, meaning intracellularly expressed proteins, which are degraded by the proteasome into peptides, then transported into the endoplasmic reticulum. Part of these peptides is then being trimmed further to the appropriate size for binding to the HLA class one molecules by ERA1. And these complexes of antigen and HLA molecule are then translocated to the cell surface and are being exposed 
to the T cell receptors of CD8 T cells. And for the basic understanding, it is very important to recognize that an HLA class one restricted CD8 T cell response is directed against the, is primarily directed against the target cell, which expresses and processes a particular cytoplasmic protein into peptide antigens. So the most likely role of HLA CO6 and 2 in psoriasis would be mediating an autoimmune response of CD8 T cells against a particular target cell type through presentation of a particular self-peptide antigen. And the clue to solve this issue is the T cell receptor of the CD8 T cells because it determines both HLA restriction and antigen specificity of the particular T cells. And indeed, CD8 T cells play an important role in disease manifestation, as we know from the human skin transplant in the AGR mouse xenotransplantation model, blocking of recruitment of T cells into the epidermis and of activation of CD8 T cells in the epidermis completely prevents the transduction of these uh, transplants into a psoriatic phenotype. Here you see the effect of CD8 antibodies blocking the formation of psoriasis uh, changes. We also know from T cell receptor analysis and from single cell T cell receptor analysis that these CD8 T cells are clonally expanded. They produce the TC17 cytokines and seem to be mostly well, or most important for the manifestation of the psoriatic skin changes. So we wanted to know which are the targets and target cells of this CD8 T cell activation. And we took a quite simple approach, which is experimentally highly difficult and took us many years. We isolated the CD8 T cells from the epidermis. We cloned the T cell receptor alpha and beta genes, uh, identified which of them are clonally expanded. Then we cloned the T cell receptor genes into plasmids. We expressed them in a uh, reporter mouse T habidoma cell line, under the con which expresses also super green fluorescence protein under the control of NFET. And whenever these T cell receptor hybridomas, which really carry in the specificity of this psoriatic, lesional psoriatic T cell response, if they see the antigen, they turn green. And it's a quite nice readout in the microscope or by fax analysis to show what is the autoimmune or the immune response in psoriasis lesions really uh, dem we are reacting against. And while we expected keratinocytes to be the targets, it was a surprise to see the T cell receptor hybridoma. Here you see a paradigmatic T cell receptor from these uh, studies. They are activated by HLA CO602 positive primary melanocytes here in the nice green cell in direct contact with these elongated uh, melanocytes from psoriatic skin. And here you see what happens if the donor is CO6 or 2 negative, no activation of the T cell receptor hybridoma. And this could also be reproduced by using melanoma cell lines. Here you see one CO6 or 2 uh, positive melanoma cell line, how it activates this T cell receptor a hybridoma, that means the T cell receptor hybridoma really recognizes or reacts against melanocytes. And since we knew what to look for, we could see that this actually happens in psoriatic skin lesions. Here you see in red, the melanocytes and in green, the CD8 T cells that are seen in very close contact to the melanocytes or their dendrites. And by triple staining, we could observe that the CD8 T cells here in blue really polarize uh, granzyme B, uh, meaning cytokines, towards the contact site with the melanocytes. Yes, you can see it here as green bubbles, uh, showing that the CD8 T cells, which are in close contact to the melanocytes, really become activated against melanocytes through ligation of the immunological synapse. Well, this also uh, raised the question, what is the antigen? We identified a peptide from a protein expressed in melanocytes called Adams-like protein 5 as the melanocyte autoantigen of this psoriatic T cell receptor. It has nicely these anchor residues required for binding into HLA CO602 and position 5 and 8 are the T cell receptor contact residues. And it was also quite interesting to see that this peptide antigen can be presented also according to in silico analysis using NET MHC-PEN 4.1 program by the other HLA, uh, 
alleles HLA plus one alleles that may be associated with psoriasis 701 or C or 702 or C or 704 or B27 because they all require the same anchor residues and belong to the same supertype. So one antigen, self-antigen, can pre be presented by the different HLA alleles associated with the risk of psoriasis. Now I mentioned in the beginning that the role of ERA1 uh, of HLA CO602 is modulated by variants of ERA1. And so we wanted to know what is actually the role of ERA1 in this process. And we generated ERA1 deficient melanoma cell clones from the melanoma cell lines that could stimulate this TC receptor. So this is the stimulation level of the T cell receptor hybridoma that we use for these experiments. Uh, by the wild type parent cell lines, and this is the stimulation by the ERA1 knockout cell lines. And you can see that in the presence of ERA1, there is actually a strong stimulation of the psoriatic T cell receptor by these melanocytes, while in the absence of ERA1, no stimulation or hardly any stimulation occurs anymore. Thus, the HLA-CO602 restricted autoimmune response against melanocytes is a reflector, is ERA1 dependent. ERA1 itself is a polymorphic gene. It has nine major coding ERA1 variants that are inherited as common haplotypes that differ in their N-terminal trimming activity. And of these haplotypes, haplotype two, with these variations in the amino acid sequence shown here, is a risk haplotype for psoriasis and ankylosing spondylitis, while this HAP10 with the amino acid exchanges at the positions shown here is protective for psoriasis and ankylosing spondylitis. So these would be the paradigmatic ERA1 haplotypes that would be relevant for psoriasis. In order to study their function, we now reconstituted the ERA1 deficient melanoma cell clones with either HAP2 or HAP10 and measured the level of activation of the T cell receptor hybridoma in co-culture experiments. And what you see here is that actually the risk haplotype has a much greater ability to restore the immunogenicity of the melanoma cell clones, of the ERA1 deficient melanoma cell clones for this T cell receptor hybridoma. And the conclusion is that uh, the ERA1 risk haplotype HAP2 promotes a strong activation of the psoriatic autoimmune response against melanocytes and thus reflects the way it increases the risk for psoriasis while the protective haplotype HAP10 uh, makes a low risk for psoriasis because the immunogenicity of melanocytes in the presence of HAP10 is low for the psoriatic autoimmune response. Now, this autoimmune response here ref against melanocytes reflects the activation of the T receptor by the autoantigen. The autoantigen, the ADAMS L5 peptide, needs to be generated from the full length protein in order to fit into the HLA CO602 binding groove, which is closed at all sides. And usually, the C terminus of these peptides is generated by a proteasomal cleavage using the proteasome, while the N terminus can be trimmed by ERA1. So the peptide achieves the appropriate size for binding for, into this HLA C binding groove. And we therefore wanted to know what is the role of ERA1 in generating the autoantigen. And we used our experimental system with HEC293 T cells as antigen presenting cells. We cloned HLACO6 and terminal LM graded Adams peptides and ERA1 haplotypes into plasmids and co expressed them in this HEC293 T cells. And if they generated an antigen that would be recognized by the T cell receptor, our hybridoma would turn green. Now, what you see here is these Adams core peptide in yellow and the N-terminal elongations. And these, all these peptides up to a length of 12 mers could stimulate the TC receptor when being expressed together with hla co 2 and wild type HEC2 cells. However, when we used ERA1 deficient HEC293 T cells for presentation, these peptides could hardly stimulate or activate the TC receptor anymore, meaning the actual core epitope was not generated from these N-terminal elongated precursors. When we then reconstituted these ERA1 deficient cell lines with HAP2, in this case, you can, you can see that the antigenicity of the peptide antigens was nicely restored. So that means that N-terminal extended Adams peptides really require ERA1 trimming for presentation. 
And again, the risk variant HUB2 was much more efficient in generating these antigenic peptides. What you see here is the comparison of HUB2 and HUB10 on the antigenicity of N-terminal elongated peptides here, 10 mers and 11 mers. And the risk variant HUB2 was much more able to generate antigenic core epitopes from these N-terminal elongated pre peptide precursors than HUB10 in terms of stimulating the T3 receptor hybridoma. And you could show that this is actually due to the trimming of the N-terminal elongated precursor peptides in vitro digestion experiments using recombinant ERAP1, HUB2, and HUB10 together with uh, synthetic Adams peptides of 11 amino acid length. HUB2 was much more efficient, much faster in digesting the 11 mers into uh, shorter peptides. Finally, the uh, non amere peptides than HUB10, just really supporting that the interaction of HLA CO602 is related to the different activities. So, in summary, in the epistasis between the main psoriasis with screen HLA CO602 and ERA1 variants really determines the autoimmune response against melanocytes through generation and presentation of a melanocyte autoantigens. If CO602 carriers have HUB2, there is much autoantigen autoantigen generated high immunogenicity of melanocytes, strong stimulation of a T response, uh, thus supporting a high risk of psoriasis in CO602 carriers, while HUB10 is just the opposite, less autoantigen, less immunogenicity of melanocytes, weak T cell stimulation, and low risk of psoriasis. And in conclusion, now in putting the reasons into a pathogenic concept, we can say that psoriasis in my eyes is based on an autoimmune response of CDA T cells against melanocytes. This autoimmune response is mediated by HLA CO602 through autoantigen presentation. The autoimmune response is ERA1 dependent because ERA1 generates the causative Adams L5 peptide autoantigen for the presentation by HLA CO602 from precursor peptides and different ERA1 variants regulate the autoimmune potential of melanocytes and strengths of the HLA class 1 restricted pathogenic immune response by different yields of an ERA1 dependent self epitome. Now, Johan has shown you a complex uh, depiction of the events that go on in psoriasis lesions. I want to put them into a sequence. And for me, the genetic variants related to pro-inflammatory pathways innate immune activation, Taiwan interference signaling, and nf kappa b cascade that Johan has already mentioned, allow for an excessive pro-inflammatory signal formation upon trivial pro-inflammatory triggers with a lot of production interferon alpha, 10 of alpha, rf 7 This generates an inflammatory infiltrate and the recruitment of melanos of T CDA T cells into the epidermis. If the patients have gene variants related to antigen processing, such as era one and to antigen presentation, such as HLA-CO2 or 2 or 6 or 2 they can present the appropriate autoantigen, which leads to the stimulation of the autoreactive T cells. If the patients have gene variants related to T cell activation, differentiation, T cell signaling, and the I23, I17 axis, these CD8 T cells differentiate into TC17 cells, which are the effect or control of I23, then produce the paradigmatic psoriasis cytokines, I17, I22, TNF-alpha, recruiting neutrophils into the epidermis and increasing keratinocyte proliferation and promoting this phenotype in the skin. And the character of this autoimmune response then would be central to the overall process uh, with being melanocytes as skin-specific target cells, the actual target of this immune response. And if we want to put this into a very simple concept, then we could say HLA-CO6 is the seed. Common gene risk variants, which are pleiotropic usually, are the fertilizers. And psoriasis is the plant that grows out from this combination. However, only if you have the appropriate HLA-C molecule uh, in your genetic composition. This is my acknowledgments. There was a lot of help from my scientific collaborators, but also from the Institute for Clinical Neuroimmunology in Munich and from the Southampton General Hospital Cancer Sciences Unit in Southampton. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Jorg and Johan, for this uh, wonderful discussion. Uh, we have now uh, time for a few questions. I think that uh, it's really uh, very stimulating 
the presentation and I'm sure that there are a lot to be discussed. So we have um, a few questions here. One from uh, uh, Enik Mosongoli. The IFN gamma signature is very strong in flux arises, yet the role of this cytokine has been debated. How do you see the role of uh, interferon gamma in psoriasis? Maybe Johan, you can start. Can you can you hear me? Yes, of course we can. Sorry, yeah, I was I was trying to activate the video again. Um, yeah, I've 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 been fascinated by interferon gamma and its potential role, and I, I'm aware of that anti-interferon gamma trial that was deemed a failure. But again, th there were some problems with that trial. In the first place, and, and it was uh, it was a very small cohort that was done, and the drug never reached steady state levels in the blood. That's what I've what I've heard about that one. So it's hard to gonna rule it out. Some patients had some improvement, but others didn't. So I don't think, and it was a short term observation. So I I think it's not truly ruled out. If you think about what interferon gamma actually does in in um, in psoriasis, it actually accelerates and activates the, inter the antigen processing and presentation in the same way as type one interferon does. Uh, so if you think that it interferes with the autoimmune component of, of psoriasis, uh, ramps up ERAP1, ramps up MHC class one HLAC expression on the surface of, of cells in psoriasis, you would expect that neutralizing interferon gamma would kind of shut down that antigen processing and presentation uh, in a similar way as you would do with uh, blocking uh, type one interference. So if you uncouple that, what, what I would expect is that it would lead to the, to the inflammatory process and psoriasis, not to go down abruptly, but actually fairly slowly. And, and I think that would require like a different clinical approach. So I wouldn't write off interferon gamma. I still think there's a role for it. We just haven't really addressed it. That being said, I don't think interferon gamma is a viable target because of potential side effects. If you take that out, you're going to be putting your patients at risk of all kinds of viral infections. So I, I think that would be a major concern. So we have a, another question from uh, Nicolas Haas. I understand that you use two melanoma cell lines as a model, uh, and he's wondering about the differences in the immunopeptidome between melanoma cells and melanocytes, uh, as far as your conclusion regarding the role of ERAP1, HAP2, and HAP10 in psoriasis? So what well, we can do is show that uh, both primarily human melanocytes and these melanoma cell lines stimulate the TC receptor if they express HLAC or 6 or 2 That means the same peptide antigen uh, that stimulates the TC receptor from me primarily melanocytes is also presented uh, by HLAC or 602 on the melanoma cell lines. There are several studies about the immunopeptidomes of melanoma cell lines, but they have hardly been compared to primary melanocytes because you need huge amounts of uh, cells to elude the peptidomes from HLA class one. So it is impossible to compare the immunopeptidomes uh, of these two cell types, even though the origin is the same. Uh, however, it shows that there are hundreds of different peptides from the cytoplasm, from the cellular proteins being presented by the HLA class one molecules. However, for HLA CO602, this has not been further differentiated. We know the immunopeptidomes, for example, for HLA CO602 positive EBV transformed B cell lines, and there are really thousands of different self peptides being presented on the cell surface and about 500 to 800 are clearly uh, presented by HLAC or 602. So there's a broad spectrum of peptides. When we knock out um, the parent protein, Adams-like protein 5 uh, in these melanoma cell lines, we see that the antigenicity of melanoma cell lines for the tissue receptor is lost. So this is really a confirmation that uh, it plays a major role to have the same peptides being presented by melanocytes and melanoma cell lines. And we also know from mutation analysis of the peptide the antigen within the parent protein that this is the case. But you should consider the principle for me of the HLA class one restricted autoimmune responses is not like for HLA class two that you have, can have any kind of soluble antigen that is being presented, but that an HLA class one 
restricted autoimmune response really requires a target cell. This is the primary principle of the role of HLA class one because it is meant to present peptides from viral infections to the immune system. Viruses that hide within the cell, they cannot be seen by antibodies and the peptides need to be somehow um, yeah, processed to be seen by the immune system. And this is the role of HLA class one. HLA class one cannot differentiate between self peptides and foreign peptides. And therefore there's a lot of tolerance mechanisms trying to avoid uh, immune activation of autoreactive T cells against self peptides. And usually this works. Probably it is the pro-inflammatory environment, which uh, I see as the fertilizers of this immune response and then facilitates that this autoimmune response is being activated through breaking of tolerance. And then it makes the skin specific autoimmune response against melanocytes. Okay, thank you very much. I think that we are uh, quite a bit um, over time. So I'll uh, pass on to uh, Chris to uh, close this session. Chris, you, you should unmute yourself. Uh, thank you. Um, Ellie, and thank you so much, Johan and uh, Jorg. I mean, this is uh, when we, Ellie and I first started thinking about this um, sweet and sour uh, with the one, one of the first uh, topics we penciled in was this particular one. So Johan and Jorg, you've done this absolute justice. And of course, as you've seen from the, the questions, uh, this is not solved yet by a long way, but uh, it was uh, food for thought, which is very appropriate for the kitchen. Um, let's, uh, so uh, of course we move on. Uh, with our um, ESDR kitchen events. And uh, the next one will be in October, I think the 6th of October. And um, we go back to the recipe book and Joachim Lundberg is going to discuss with us spatially resolved transcriptomic technology and applications in the skin. And um, before we close, just to remind you that there's still time to uh, register for our 50th annual ESDR meeting. Unfortunately, it's virtual, but um, Hopefully next year it'll be face-to-face. -face. Uh, that's uh, in uh, two weeks time. And that's going to be full of exciting uh, new um, data and psoriasis is going to feature very, very highly. So thank you again and look forward to seeing you at the ESDR meeting before our next, um, before our next uh, uh, ESDR kitchen uh, experience. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye, thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you.